from PFC. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this episode of An Audience with Pa. February is Black History Month and a part of Black History Month, we are highlighting prominent Black athletes in Canada. Our special guests today are bronze and gold medalists from the Canadian women's rugby team who also fight for equal rights and are advocating for racial justice on and off the field. Uh, there will be a Q&A during this, and we will answer questions at the end. So at the bottom of the screen, there is a little Q&A where you can send us your questions that you have. Um, so now I would like to introduce to you head coach of PFC, Hamaduka, and Canadian rugby stars, Charity Williams, Pam Buisa, and Brianne Nicholas. Hey, Katie. Hey, ladies. Hope you guys are doing well. Thank you very much for wanting to join me on this an audience with Pamaduka, I truly appreciate it, especially when we talk about um, uh, Black History Month as well as uh, Black Lives Matters. And I know the three of you are people from uh, run this, you know, and it's been great to have you guys here. So welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, yeah, ladies, like um, it's good to see because it's not very often that uh, honestly you see black female in uh, rugby. Maybe I'm wrong, but so far I haven't been able to see many and seeing you guys. Could you guys talk to me a little bit about your upbringing and why rugby? For you start. So you want oh, me to start? Course, Don't be shy now. <laughs> yeah, I can start. Uh, I'm from a small town in Ontario. Uh, sport was my go-to at a young age. I didn't start rugby until grade nine, but I did do sport from about grade two going on. Uh, it was just a place where I could let everyday life just set, a, set aside and then play. Um, yeah, from being from a small town, I guess it's not, it wasn't ethically diverse, so there wasn't too many ethnicities out there. So in sport, like, I didn't have racism directly per se, but like it did happen. Yeah, like more so like in comments such as, oh, you're only fast because you're black. But in rugby, I found it was way more accepting. Like I was more, it's like more of a diverse sport and they accept people of different ethnicities. They accept people of different body structures and that kind of stuff kind of thing um what else do you want to know <laughs> no, 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 it's good i don't know as a pam you being from congo and uh, explain a little bit of your background congo okay. okay uh i'm part indigenous part white and part african so my family the most recent generations have grew up in canada but i do know in the past i have had people in my family who escaped from slavery in the States. So I don't know exactly where my roots fully come from, but I do know that kind of stuff. But yeah, okay. I've been looking into it more so. So yeah, that's what I know. Well, that's good. So it would be nice to be able to trace back and look uh, and look where, where your grand grandparents are from and stuff like that. That is nice. Yeah. That is that's really good. And Pam, you are Congolese. I am. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I am Congolese, yeah. So um, both my parents are from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I was born here, uh, well, in Ottawa, Gatineau, um, the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg Territory. Um, and I, we moved to the Quebec side. So before my parents actually moved to uh, Canada, they actually lived in South Africa. Oh. Um, so I guess that was like their earliest exposure to rugby really, but it wasn't really ingrained. And so when we moved out here, um, well, when they moved out here and I was born here, um, yeah, sport was very much, yeah, kind of to echo with Brienne, it was like an escape for me. It was kind of a, a place where, you know, I was usually the tall, lanky girl, super muscular, but I liked to play basketball. Basketball and volleyball was my two first loves. And then, I got fouled out always in basketball. I was just too aggressive. Um, I like to hit people. So once I was exposed to rugby, it was like, you know, it was great because there it was okay to be muscular. It was okay to be physical. It was okay to hit people and then be rewarded for that. 
Um, and then like also whatever frustrations are there, it's good. Really good, yeah. Um, and you, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm from uh, Toronto, Ontario, <clears throat> but uh, I guess my 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 roots are um, Jamaican. Both my parents are are Jamaican, and um, yeah, I started playing rugby when I was in high school. I think I was like in grade ten, and I I used to be a gymnast before I started playing rugby, and uh, I was. I was pretty powerful, like in the gym, but when I went onto the pitch, it was like a completely different. I was like, "Oh, okay." Like, I knew I was strong, but like, damn. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it's kind of similar sentiments. Like, it was. It felt like a place where um, I was like accepted for for like the different strengths that I had, um, and and it like it, in terms of like representation of color. Like, I didn't. Um, grow up playing rugby with a lot of people who look like me but rugby definitely makes room for like all types of bodies and different um skill sets and everything so it's it's it is very much like a diverse sport in the sense of um like I feel like every body has a position on the pitch but I personally I didn't um, necessarily have a lot of BIPOC teammates um really until like the last few years mm -hmm. honestly so I so like when you guys are explaining that like rugby being a, a sport which is very receptive, you know, to you know to all the different cultures, backgrounds, as men, whatever, how does that relate in your daily uh, life as a black woman? Now we talk about uh, Black History Month, right? and I know people focus a lot about maybe the male, but for me, I want to know like the narrative of being being a black woman in society and the perception that you that is torn upon upon like upon blacks females. Like could you guys talk to you a little bit about that? Yeah, I think like at least for me, like I know a very common perception of, of um black women um is that we are like we, <laughs> which it's like a, it's a mis it's like common perception but also it's it's a bit true but I think it could be harmful is that we're like very strong and like can withstand anything and so and because of that conception people are often like um there's a lot of violence thrown towards us because people just think we can handle it um mm -hmm. and in some cases it's true like um women women in general have to go through a lot but like when you are a black woman at that or um indigenous or personal color or whatever intersection that you um stand within like there's a lot of added um, I'd say oppression that gets thrown at you. And so I think like, yes, the common misconception is that like, yeah, like black women are strong, BIPOC women are very strong, but um, not to say that you can just continuously keep putting us down without us feeling that and experiencing that. Um, and like in terms of sport, I think like even just, you know, being black in a, like a very strong sport, like it's the same thing, like, um, you know, yeah, we're strong. We work out every day, and, and we we put a lot of time into our bodies and, and making our bodies very strong. But I think sometimes there's not a lot of focus on the mental side of the game, and I think that's also really important. Bam! Somebody that want to touch upon it a little bit, or can go ahead, Ree. <laughs> <laughs> you can go this time because <laughs> you had your mic unmuted. Um, yeah, to echo what Charity says is that I think, yeah, with strong, you know, like a sport, like a physical contact sport, there's so much uh, discrepancies in terms of um, how people even treat, um, when we think about like what is a masculine body, oftentimes we think of it as a male body, but when we think about it within the context of a contact sport, sometimes um, a lot of women or people that identify as women are, you know, put stereotypes that, you know, again, like what Charity was saying is that like, okay, you're strong, but we kind of overlook the mental health aspects of the aspects where you can be vulnerable. Um, I find that sometimes when you, <clears throat> with again, contact sports is that, you know, whether it be visibility, when we look at it in media, oftentimes you will see, you know, boxing or, you know, rugby within certain fields, but then to watch um, women play, um, you have to pay to watch or even, you know, to, you have to find different mediums to even find out that, you know, women do play contact sports, let alone play rugby. 
So I think with that, um, the added layer on top of that of being a person of color is that it makes it difficult because again, as a woman and a person that identifies as such, you have to already fight for that visibility already within that intersection. And then on top of that, there's already a disproportionate representation of people of color already there. So it's like almost like another added layer that makes it difficult to fight for visibility. But on top of that, um, even your perspective and even structures in play may not even allow for more people that do look like me to be there in the first place uh, with whatever barriers that come with that. So it makes it <clears throat> difficult to, um, you know, navigate sometimes when sometimes the structures in itself may not allow for you to be seen, heard, um, or even continue to, to stay in the square. Brian, you want to touch upon it a little bit also regarding you having a little bit of indigenous background in there as well, because black people and indigenous people maybe have gone through the same struggles as well, you know, and now I know people also talk a lot about Black History Month, but I think also it's very important to touch upon the indigenous people's history about, especially in Canada as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, Charity and Pam really touched well upon being female in sport and being uh, of a different national or uh, ethnic background, being in sport, and then me having indigenous as well as black and being white. It's a bit different, not different, but it is in the sense like, I'm not fully one group or I'm not fully categorized in a certain section. So sometimes, yeah, the identity thing is plays a role in it too. So people, yeah. So um, you really have to know your roots and like stick up for what you stand for. I'm like, I'm here to play also. We're all here to play. We are representing not only our backgrounds, but females and we're representing our country and we're playing other countries who are trying to do the same thing. And with regards to the whole indigenous land and the territories and everything, I like how nowadays we're really trying to implement doing the land acknowledgements and all that stuff. So we're not disregarding other people's nationalities and that we came from like with indigenous, we're here first. And yeah, I appreciate all that stuff and there's still a lot of ways to go but yeah charity and pam i agree with what they say too but you but you touch on a very nice subject that i want to go forward to it as well it's like knowing where you belong because you have you you are uh, partly white you are partly black so when you look at yourself and then now that you have pam and charity like when you guys came to the rugby which group did you navigate it to? Like, because I want people to understand that sometimes like people will talk about groups, right? It's not like we don't like other groups, but sometimes you navigate to the group that you know, and you know that you can see like, all right, this is my group, right? It's just, it's just a normal thing. So I just want them asking you like, where did you felt? Uh, I guess initially, like you always scope the area and you're like, okay, I see you, I see you, I see you. And I feel like I could flow amongst the groups and be accepted in all the groups. Like I always had the question of what's your background? Yeah. And the, if I say, oh, I'm part black, people are like, oh yeah, you can tell. But like I always got bothered by that question. But now I know just people are curious. But with regards to the black group, group if you want to call it group I was always more accepted I find in the sense they're more like oh you're one of us yeah you're one of us it was almost more like oh we're happy you're one of us whereas both whites just like yeah you just float along it's like yeah you're white but you're also part black you're also part indigenous but with yeah I find with black it's always like yeah you're one of us it's almost as like you feel way more accepted I don't know that's my experience but and, and and how was your experience, Pam, or Charity, like like being in sport, but also when you guys navigated and seeing one another, is, is it a kind of an acknowledgement knowing, all right, we made it, or is it like, oh, I'm happy that I have somebody that is that is that is a woman that is same as me and you know, you're not alone. Because sometimes it might be a lonely place if you're alone. Could you guys touch upon that? Yeah, for for myself it was it was pretty cool because I remember 
Um, at the time, I wasn't at, on the team yet, but I remember watching the Olympics and seeing Charity Williams and me, my dad, my aunties were all cheering and Charity was like, you know, what looked like us on TV playing the sport of rugby. So for us, it was just, it was, it was really cool to see that parallel being at home and having that representation and what that meant. Um, and after that, seeing how things shifted, you know, like there's a lot more like young um, people of color on the team now and seeing how like that's evolved. And I think um, in terms of like even groupings, I think it's, I think it's not even necessarily in terms of, you know, that like certain people stick with, I think it's what's familiar. And I think oftentimes, like when I was on new on the team, I was like from, you know, Ottawa Gatineau, I had my slang, you know, like if I play Afro beats, like I had certain people that were more familiar to it. Um, and then others were just kind of like, what is this? Like, who are you? What are you, you know, what are you about? Right. And so I think the more and more I became more confident in my identity, the more I felt even confident to like share it, playing on the sidelines, having my teammates now know, you know, the music that I know, but that, that took that, you know, familiarity and that ability to feel comfortable in my own skin and having people around me to make me feel that same way too. All right, because because that brings me to the um, yeah, to the talks of um, like changes because I have a, like same as same as some of you guys like you guys don't know but I was eight when I when I first went to Norway, right? I mean it's one of the coldest country you ever be in, you know, and I was basically surrounded by blondes, right? So it was blondes everywhere. So then you can imagine. So the 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 perception that and the perspective I like to give people is imagine ten blondes. And a black star. That was that was who I was, right in the middle of them. So, so I can understand. But the change that I want to talk to, like in people's mind, because I think uh, people sometimes think change is bad, or they're afraid of change because they have they're in this fixed mindset. But I want people to understand that what we are talking about about our history, it's a it's a ongoing battle. Like we try to change something that has been within us for over 400 years when we like when we talk about it. So uh, so what we try to tell people is not, we're not screaming for everybody to change whatever. We, we, we are talking about elements of our life that is very important for us, which is equality. It's like, so how is it to like to feel inequality to 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 a white woman or or just being black in general, like in a system which is not designed for you? Um. <clears throat> yeah, I think like, it's it's so important it's so necessary and even when we talk about like equality i feel like what it really is like i feel like what we're really looking for is is equity amongst everyone because like i think at this point with the structures in place and and with like um the, the colonization of like almost every institution on earth at this point um i don't even think like equality is is possible right now. I think we have to think in terms of like what's equitable for um, different intersectionalities, and then with that um, equity, then we can like get to a point where where we are equal with one another. Um, in terms of like, in terms of sport, I think one of the biggest things um, that are stopping us from getting to a point to that point is just those conversations and, and being open and honest and, and brave with one another and, and having like very strength based conversations, but knowing that, yeah, like, um, things are going to look different. Um, you may not be at the forefront all the time anymore. Um, you may have to give somebody space that you've previously, um, occupied. Um, I think like sometimes it could be scary. Um, but I think it's absolutely necessary that we move forward in a very decolonizing way and in a way that encourages and opens up space for BIPOC um, women and men and whoever you identify as, like to be there, be seen, be heard, and like be represented in those spaces. Um, yeah, I think like representation is also one of the most important things and and even like when I when I met um, you for the first time, I was like, "This is the head coach. Like, let's go!" <laughs> like you know, like I was so I was so like I don't even want to use the words proud because I don't even like like you know we're not on that level. But I was just like like this is amazing and like this is what I want to see everywhere. Like 
we need as as BIPOC people like if I look up to my organization and all I see is is um white faces then I know I I can't be represented in that space and like I don't know um you know who's fighting for me because a you you know the experiences that I've had as an athlete as a black athlete um <clears throat> you just want you just couldn't know and so I think like at that point it's like you really you really don't really have anyone fighting for you so I, I would just feel safer um and more acknowledged as an athlete if I looked up and, and to you know the higher ups and I saw people who looked like me and yeah okay yeah that made me think of um a quote that I had heard um that said, like, I don't know how you feel, but I do by the state of your institution. And that was by um, James Baldwin. And it basically made me think about, you know, some, it, it's kind of like that change that you're speaking about is that, you know, it's not like we're asking, we're, we're just asking to be seen, heard, acknowledged, you know, as Bree was mentioning, like territorial acknowledgement is situating where your roots come from, even understanding like what brought you here. And it's really important so that you understand um, there's that level of accountability to understand that, okay, my I got to these lands through this way. Um, and then you understand also like the history of potential harm or potential good that has been done. And then you can move, you know, respectfully accordingly. So it's important, I think, with that is like within institutions is understanding the history of where that comes from. That's why this month is so important is understanding, you know, who is there, who is there before us and who's, you know, coming next. And I think with change, it's acknowledging the histories and understanding what the struggles were before, how we can overcome them, and how we can more for move forward to change these things. So, um, yeah, with institutional change, it's it's a shift in mindset. It's that change that's necessary so that you know we can have uh, representation. We can have you know a shift in mindset so we can have a pathway so people can get in these positions of power um, and, and just positions. Period. Also. But do you, do you ladies feel that when one of us are in those positions that there's a there's a target on your back to you feel like, all right, your every move is gonna be watched. So you are kind of a little bit like a little bit hesitant to be on to be yourself because you are you are put in a part you are put in a position where it's not normally is for us to be honest, right? Because that's the way it is. So, because what I want our viewers to understand is this is a, like this is an audience for us to educate and make people aware of things that people normally don't see, but this is happening to us. It's like, for instance, if I speak about football, that we are maybe, and you think of how many black players play soccer, we are maybe around the world five black head coaches. Right, and then you imagine how people play. So that's why for me as well is, I am like I, I like I'm in a spot where I'm lucky to be at a club and to be at the with people that acknowledge what I can do, but also allow me the platform to be able to speak about it and educate people around me so that we can move forward to 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 a more diverse and uh, and better organization. You know, like, Per se. So to have that voice is very important. And I do feel like um, some some of our people that were in, in these kind of positions did, didn't necessarily have the space and the voice to able to speak on it, right? So, and like and I say, when you when we go back just five, ten years ago, it, like the rally that we, that happened all this year around the world, I mean, it kind of, I think it kind of opened people's eyes in like in terms of wow, is this what they truly go through? But for us, it's like, oh, now people are realizing this has been happening for 400 years. So when we speak, we're not speaking about what you guys see now. We're speaking about what's been happening. Like, especially black women, like, you know, you, you guys know getting raped or like doing stuff about and stuff that even, even, even was not done to men. So for me, it's like, when you see that and as leaders in your field, what does that make for you for the future generation? Yeah, I like what you said before earlier about um, like, do you feel like there's a target on your back when you're in those spaces? And like, one hundred percent, I feel like <clears throat> I feel like I've I've 
been lucky enough to be around different communities and, and um, different Black leaders in this last year, and I've learned so much from them. But what I've also seen is that um, their voice and their reach is very limited. And I think it's, it's tough because, um, especially like in those high up places, there's, there's usually only room or they usually only make space for one like mm -hmm. person of color or one BIPOC person. And, um, everybody else is like looking for the, looking at them to like make this amazing change, make this big, huge change and this huge shift. But it's like often people in those positions actually don't have the power that they might have if they were um, if they were white, and and so like it's something to me that's always so frustrating is is like one it's all it feels like it's like a rat race to get to the spot to get to that one spot that's available to you, and then when you get there, you're not really afforded the same um, opportunities that like maybe your colleagues have or, or what would normally be offered from, from, of you in, in that position. Um, which is like, which is really frustrating. Um, and then like, um, when we talk about like how, how to like move forward or, or for us as women, like for me, it's, it's, it's strength in numbers and it's like having, like very strong women like Pam and Brie on on our side and, and like pushing pushing our cause forward and like like I said it's usually it's only space for one but like have, having these strong women makes me feel like we can all go together and like I think that's what's that's what's been missing from quote unquote the black community I don't like saying that because there's so many of us but yeah. in terms of this real quick like I think one of the biggest things you struggle with is like there's always only one spot, but if we all like push through together and push hard and like don't stop knocking until the door opens, then like what are they really gonna do? <laughs> so fast. I mean, I mean, seeing 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 what uh, the sports world have done also for the Black Lives Matter. Uh, uh, you ladies have been the front runners on the like we've seen you. Uh, was this space granted for you, and what made what made you ladies? Or have this strong voice that now is the time. Like you, like Pam, Charity, Bree, you guys have been front runners for this. Like, can you guys touch upon it? Yeah, I would say, I, I think, I think it, I didn't really know when the time was. I just knew that I needed to say something because I felt like I had no choice. I felt as though, like, literally what had happened, like the biggest awakening was Olympics was postponed. I can't go home because there's COVID pandemic. We just see and witnessing, you know, George Floyd murdered on our phones. You know, I haven't had African food in a hot in a long time, you know, and I'm just kind of like, what do I do? I, I don't know what to do. The only thing I can do is pick up my phone and and just stay connected. And that's all I could do. And I I someone in community, Vanessa Simone, reached out to me and was like, hey, I'm I'm having a rally. And I was like, okay. I, I've never attended a rally. I've never did anything of that sort. But what I did was I brought water bottles, and I saw her walking around and and being and, and trying to mobilize and things like that. And I realized I can do something. What can I do? I can pick up my phone and call. And it's really interesting also when we talk about even our phones. Every single phone, like a lot of the electronic devices, there's a mineral called Colton, which actually comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's almost interesting now that I think about it now is the way that we utilize our phones. It's at the expense of someone. Every time we we do something, you know, we we use it recklessly when we when we don't pay attention to how things can potentially cause harm, we can be irresponsible about it. And so when I'm thinking about my phone and I'm thinking about where these minerals come from, I realize that it's at the root of where the foundations of my people were. So using my voice, using my platform is not only uplifting the message as Terry was talking about, but also empowering and 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 being grateful for the histories in which has allowed for us to even be able to communicate to the degrees that we do. So um, with that, you know, the the awakening was having a rally and and being in community um, with different people, with different, you know, shapes, colors, um, positions in life, and realizing that. You know, you don't know what your reach is unless you don't speak up, right? And I think it's important when we when we talk about 
whether it's activism or creating a change or even thinking about what's next is understanding what your responsibility is and not being complacent with that. When you know that, you know, I do know this person that could do something, then do it. When you don't use your voice, you're actively engaging in a form of violence, right? If I have access to a phone and I can directly call someone to help someone else out and I don't use that, I'm directly acting in cre and creating more violence. Silence equals violence. So when you know better, we can't stay complacent. That was that urgency. So it wasn't one that awakening is I was pinned against the wall and had no choice. Right. You know, I was seeing people that look like me die. You know, I, I was watching on my phone in Nigeria, people protesting for their freedoms, dying. So things like that. So, so the more, the more we engage with, with what we have and the more that we tune into that, the more opportunities we can have to create change. Great. Uh, yeah, I'd like, to, uh, I, I, I'd say it's unfair to say that I would be as strong of a vocal as Cherry and Pam has been. Like they've been more at the forefront as me, so I don't think it's fair to say that I've been as much of an impact as they have. They have definitely been doing a lot for this community and for black voices around. And that inspires me to also get out of my comfort zone and speak up and also help with the BLM movement and just everything with that. And they always try and get me out of my comfort zone too. And to say, oh, your voice is needed. It's heard to get out there. So that's one reason I agreed to the call also to try and get out of my comfort zone and to be more like Charity and Pam and help with the <laughs> movement. So that's what I would like to say. Charity, do you have anything to say? No, you're good. <laughs> No, for example, like, um, uh, um, I mean, Katie, question to you, like, because now we got the ladies talking. You as a lady, what was it, your interaction, let's say, with the first black person that you ever met, right? Um, I would say the, the one that sticks out the most is probably when I started playing soccer um, for my youth club. It must have been around five or six, which seems kind of old. Um, but there was someone of a person of color on another team in the same club and sh she was really the only one um so that was what really stood out um to me more so um just people recognizing it us recognizing it i mean i ended up we went we transferred to the same club and we ended up playing our whole youth together and mm -hmm. became quite good friends but that was probably the first one that i really can remember and, and take in was was meeting her when we were five or six at soccer yeah. Like, because, I mean, uh, the nice thing is we all here uh, play sports. And what I like to say is I'm like, in any sports you play, like, nobody sees color, right? But as soon as we enter society, now people see color. So, it's like, so like, that's why I, still, I, I like to tell people, I'm like, we talk about the pandemic now, but we have yet to erase the biggest pandemic in the world, which is racism, All right? So for me, I like to say, okay, how do we educate and make people understand that no matter who we are, deep down, we're still the same people. And for me, that's why like, it's good we have Black History Month, but it's great if we could continue to celebrate it uh, like every single day, because I think when we, when we bring that powerful message together and make people understand, I think that it is more powerful than people just making it a single month per se. But I think we need to continue the conversation and having this conversation with the people that is amongst us, because that's the only way that we will be able to to move forward. What's your thought process on that? Um, <clears throat> I actually, like, I've, yeah, so I've been on the team for for just about eight years now, and I guess, like, I'm socially, eight. I, eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so I guess like socially, I've I've built up like a bit of a following from from people all over the world, and um, you know, I, I my Instagram is is pretty like I post a lot of things, whatever, like social media. <laughs> but um, 
I have a lot of fans, I guess, and a lot of people in the community who who, who love when I play rugby and they love watching the videos and the side of whatever. And this past year, um, I really shifted away from posting about rugby. And it's been a lot more about social justice and like things I'm doing, community um, projects that I'm working on, and and yeah, just like things that I see as issues or or, or things that I want to highlight or whatever. And the amount of messages that I get um, consistently over Instagram about like the fact that I should stop posting about this and just keep like posting my rugby or that um, my Instagram page is hateful and people are going to unfollow me or that, um, you know, like, like, why don't you just keep running around on the field and, and like, why are you doing all this? Like, you know, just like the switch. And, and when you said like, you know, when when we're as as people who are black when we're on the field we're not black but when we're off all of a sudden it's like oh my god I didn't realize you had color on you mm -hmm. and so like <laughs> that's something that that I I experience constantly it's like you know if I'm just playing rugby everyone's like super on board and wants to support me and wants to see me um you know flourish on the field but once I have a real lived experience or once I'm you know shedding light on something that is incredibly problematic or maybe just different than someone else's experience like all of a sudden um people are unhappy and people are like oh oh I didn't realize you had something to say I wasn't here for that yeah so <laughs> um yeah those are things that like it's just it's like I feel like people just kind of forget like um that we're actually human beings beyond our sport we're holistic people and like we we have you know strengths and weaknesses and fears and we have experiences that like all like all together like turn it like turn us into the people that we are and like as much as i love rugby and representing um you know this team um it's not who i am like i'm not an athlete like i'm like i'm a human being who like enjoys the sport and you know i put a lot of time into it but that's not who i am to the core um and i just feel like people often forget that when they look at people like athletes in general but often um bipoc athletes how has the support been um from your teammates from the people around you know has there been people that um <clears throat> that have come up and say, you know what, I'm glad that you that you ladies are doing this again, especially being black, because uh, black ladies, black females, I mean, is there any role models that you that you had growing up that was a black female athlete or leaders, like in Canada? Anyone else? Um, uh, I can go. Oh, well, a male, I can say a male one was always Muhammad Ali. I always looked up to him. But more recently for a female Canadian black athlete would be Felisa George, who was the two-time where she went to like both the winter and the summer Olympics. And I find she is a positive, strong black athlete who has a positive influence. And I find she is a got a medal and everything so i feel like she's someone up there for me for an inspiration to follow um. yeah for myself um i'm realizing that yeah a lot of my athletic like people that inspired me were people like latoya blackwood and meg lee harvey um they were uh they played for team canada played rugby for team canada um, Meg Lee, I actually like lived on her couch for a bit. Um, and I just, I just appreciated how even regardless of whatever barriers they experienced, they brought that, um, as, as fuel for when they played like Latoya Black with this, she just did not, you know, allow anybody in her way. She would hit you so hard, you know, and I appreciated that that like aggression was something that she brought to the field consistently. I appreciated that Meg Lee Harvey would step you and make you look stupid consistently. And I and I and I I like the their their capacity to channel their what was going on in their lives into how that they, they executed the game. And I think that that's a skill that I try to develop and and continue to fuel. And I think as for my teammates, I think that um, we've definitely come a long way. I think that there's a lot more conversation. And I think once we're able to be relational with one another and 
see each other beyond our you know skill sets and if you're able to run faster hit harder or tackle whatever people got to see you for you and i think that whenever there's more opportunities for you to see your teammate as a human with feelings that you know maybe they're upset and didn't have a good pass because you know their head is somewhere else because they just finished watching you know something traumatic on their phones you know or whatever it may be but i think we've now come to a place where there's more conversation and a bit more understanding of someone's humanity versus um, expecting whatever uh, of them. So I think there's more opportunity now to see each other. Okay, I think there's some questions coming up. We do, okay, so I'll give you the first question we have is how can female and male athletes come together to support equality in sport moving forward? I mean, for me, I think, um, I think I think the biggest thing that we saw this year was actually athletes being front runners, you know, try to galvanize us us people, you know, to be together, but also stand up. And I think that's why it's important for me as well to have this conversation with the, with female athletes, you know, to hear the thought process of how they think things that we I may take for granted because I'm a male, but something that I can help with or something they can help us with, and and you know, and together we can build a platform where voices their voices can be heard and people can truly understand who they are as people and things that matters to them daily and things that they want to get out and i think as people and as sports athletes if we listen to one another and stand together i think that would be a powerful message and seeing the seeing how nfl has try to do it, see how NBA players, see how the WNBA have done it, and see the rugby girls, you know, that are in Victoria standing up talking, even us as a team in the CPL as well, you know, trying to bring that awareness. That is the way for me to go by because sport is beloved, but we're trying to get the, the reason out of the sport by standing together. Ladies? Um, I have a question. I'd... Um like to know as a coach how can we i mean my first my first thing as a coach is the development of my players and making sure that i have a safe environment for everyone to to be themselves and feel comfortable so if coaches hear or see some racism things happening within their team how's the best way to go about addressing this um i think at least like as a player, um, I would say number one, first and foremost, it's important before any decisions is made is that the, the, the person who was recipient of that harm is at the center of it. So I think before even that happens is how engaged are you in your players lives? Like, how do you know them? Like, do you, if you care about them beyond before this even happened, do you know, um, what, uh, implications or effects that may have. So like, say for example, something was to happen on my team. If my coach knows how I am and how I respond, I am better suited to know how to, how to, to deal with that issue. I think number one is that level of accountability with someone being in a position of power. It's important to uh, name it, to state that what was the issue, that that was wrong. Um, and also allowing within that solution process is to allow for the person who was recipient of that harm to be able to just to, to see how that justice can be played out and and not necessarily make the calls that i've seen sometimes of like whether it be in schools where it's like um there is you know an account with someone being racist but um you know someone was racist and then the teacher is like oh um well uh, sorry about that that won't happen again but then it continues and then that kid is left with that sentiment so in the decision-making processes, it's important to be in constant communication with that player who has received that, that racist remark. Then also it's important to center their voice and understand and name what that issue is so that that person who created that harm has the opportunity to learn that what you did was wrong, why, and, and take the courses ac accordingly. It's not going to look the same every single time because not every single um, thing will look the same because we're different people. But it's also important to center their voice within whatever decision is made to make sure that they feel safe in that environment. That's yeah. 
Uh, so, Pam, uh, what was your major again? I think it's very important that people understand your major because you and like you and Charity are still in school, and it's very important because I know for a fact that once you say it, people will go, "Huh, I didn't expect that." Yeah, I'm studying political science, minor in social justice. I feel like people expect it. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Well, I tell you that I, I, I tell you, and I'm being honest. There's not many people that would expect it. I'll, I'll tell you. If we were to ask some of our audience if they truly expect that, I, I want them to answer me 100 percent with honesty. <laughs> Did some of you actually expect it out of band? Is there somebody answering, Katie? I, I, I truly want to see if somebody answer yes. I'll keep you updated. Yes, please do that. <laughs> um, I'll get into another question. This is more moving on to your play playing with rugby. Um, so the question is, can you tell us how it felt to win the Pan American and Olympic medals? It is a huge achievement that you should be very proud of. Um, okay, well, I can speak for, I didn't go to the Pan Am Games, uh, but I went to the Olympics and it was one of the most amazing, um, like, times of my life. I had, I have wanted to be an Olympian since I can remember, like, remembering anything. And getting to that um, spot was kind of like, honestly, like a testament to, to like, my life and my journey and, and um, it, it wasn't easy getting there. There was a lot of adversity that I had faced um, by being, you know, a, a, a woman, um, someone who was a woman of color, and just like you know where I came from and and my personal life experiences. But the Olympics was insane, um, and I, yeah, I don't know. Like I don't even know how. Sometimes I'm like I don't know how to put it into words. Like. It was, it was, I guess it was five years ago now, but it feels like um, we were just there and, and getting a bronze medal was, was a really cool experience. And I, I hope that at some point in the future, like we get to do it again and that would be really cool. But you know, COVID and the world burning and stuff. <laughs> Uh, I didn't attend the Olympics, but I attended the Pan Am Games, and same feelings as charity. I mean, Pan Ams isn't as high up of a tournament, but winning and getting together with your teammates and putting everything that you put work on in practice, coming out on the field at the tournaments, and just being able to live that experience with everyone that you work hard with, it was awesome. And, yeah, like Cherry said, too, it's like growing up, all I wanted to do was be a professional athlete from as far as I could remember. And then I was with the team when we went to, the, our team went to the Olympics and watching all my teammates up on the podium just inspired me that much more to just go out there and do my, shoot for my dream and I could be with them also. So it was inspiring. It, I was very thrilled for them and it was really awesome watching from home and it makes me work that much harder to, be with them on the next Olympics. Oh, we have a question here, uh, Katie, and I think this one is a good one. Um, yes, uh, is it, would you like to read it out, Paul? Yes. How do you think diversity in Victoria and BC in general, and how does this differ from the places in Canada that you've lived in or competed in? I think this one is a very good question. We want to take it. Uh, sure. Diversity in comparison. Well, where I was from, I had at least 50 ladies that can do my hair. I could know exactly where I can go to get the food that I needed to, you know, feel full. I, you know, my dad had a place to get his hair cut at the barbershop and there was like 15 places. There, it was, it was, there was just a lot more things that I can do. I remember when I first moved to Victoria, I had to go on yellow pages to find out who can braid my hair, right? I, I was 17 at the time and I needed to find a way to still do basic things like finding places where I can find lotions that can, you know, make sure my elbows aren't ashy. Like it, it was just simple things that, you know, 
you know, if you're not a racialized person that you don't have to think about is something that I need to like feel, right? Like at the time I didn't, you know, my hair was quite different from this. And so I needed these things to, to maintain. Like if I went to training, I have to make sure that my hair is in braids so that, you know, when I am making hits that it's not in my face or flying in the air or breaking. So in terms of diversity, they're in comparison from where, where I was, where I grew up, it was very, very different and not as much. I, although I do think that as Victoria is evolving, um, that there, we're here, but it's just in different silos and, and we're very um, spaced out. And I also think that there's not a lot of opportunity to connect. Um, I think that there's not that many centers where, you know, black and racialized people can connect. There's not a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's now a lot more people. I think after seeing at the rally, um, it was really interesting. We're like, okay, like I had a friend who was patrolling and she's like, there's a lot of people of color here. And we like stop the rally. We're like, all right, all the POCs come in the front and everybody just started moving. So we're here is just, um, it's not fair to say that there's not any people of color. I think it's simply that we're not that present and there's not a lot of structures in place so that we can be together, right? There's not a lot of, you know, like places that we can go to. So you know, if you do see the one, you're like, I remember when I first moved to Victoria, I see a black person, and I'm like, giving them the eyes, like, hey, you made it. <laughs> like, How's it going? <laughs> Go on. Like, I'm happy to see you, you know, because it's that familiarity that like, you know, like seeing someone that looks like you really like it hits home because then I feel like, oh, like I, I'm not alone. I, I'm not I'm not the only one. Yeah, I agree with Pam. Like, I feel like um, I feel like for, for like all these years I've been in Victoria, I thought like I knew the five other black people who were here and they were like my teammates. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, that's it. Um, but it wasn't until this last year where we actually opened up spaces for BIPOC people to like feel welcome and seen and heard and like, like wanted like to be there that I was like, oh my God, Victoria has a huge black community. There's just, there's just nowhere for, for, there's just no spaces available for us to be and like be comfortable. So I think like, this last year with the, with the two rallies and with, um, with, uh, like with, with the murals and the different, like, just did, like opening up different spaces for us to just like be comfortable and express ourselves in different ways. Um, I think it's like, I'm like seeing more and more people who look like me. Um, and it's just, it's just easier to like, to be here. Like I've, I've, I've always felt the, they kind of want to go home back to Toronto because like literally like it's just so diverse in the city. Um, but this last year I've, I've thought like, you know, this could actually be somewhere I can see like me spending more time because I feel like um, I could have a home here too, just with the amount of people who make me feel comfortable and, and safe to be in my own skin in this city. Oh, Katie? Yes, well, Charity, Pam, Brianne, thank you so much for joining us today. You are truly amazing role models, both on and off the field. It was amazing listening to you and your stories. Um, Paul, as always, thank you so much. And to everyone, make sure you look at our newsletter and our social media to see our next an audience with Paul and who our special guests will be. Thank, Thank you, you ladies. Thank you very much for doing this, ladies. Truly appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.